So in this part of lab uh, 36, we're going to cover a group of animals that are belong to the phylum Cnidaria. And an older name for Cnidaria was the Salenterata or phylum Salenterata. There are uh, three classes mentioned in the background information. Uh, and then there's a fourth group given at the end. Uh, and these groups are at the next rank right below phylum uh, called classes. So. What are these three that are mentioned in the background? They are uh, the class Hydrozoa, which are the uh, hydroids. And then we have the class Scyphozoa. And these include, include a group that you're probably familiar with. We call these the sea jellies or uh, jellyfish. And then we have the class Anthozoa, and the class Anthozoa includes uh, sea anemones, and and corals. These uh, are small animals that build these large and build these large structures called coral reefs. Uh, and the class that's not mentioned in the background that we'll see here at the end is the class Cubozoa. And the cubozoa are commonly called the box jellies, and you'll see why. Because uh, they're box shaped, right? So uh, the nigeria uh, develop from uh, two embryonic tissues early uh, in development, uh, and this is referred to as diploblastic. If you uh, like humans and other higher animals, they develop from three germ layers. That would be triple plastic. And these, these germ layers uh, include endoderm, that's on the inside, and ectoderm. So the ectoderm would become like the epidermis to the outer layer covering. And sometimes they're referred to the, the endoderm as the gastrodermis because it uh, lines the inside wall of their digestive cavity. So if we were to look at the difference between radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry, if you took the main axis of the body uh, of a sea anemone, right now we're looking at a sea anemone in this, in this picture here, which is radial symmetry. And the sea anemones are typically uh, attached at least for uh, a certain period of time. If we look at it from the side view, at the top would be the mouth, and here would be the foot of the animal, and it would be maybe attached to a rock or something, uh, and it would uh, it would take food in through there. Uh, but if I were to look at the long axis of the body, the main axis of the body, and so if we look at that from above, okay, if we look at this from above, that's what we're doing here in this picture on the bottom. We're looking at the animal from above. And if we were to slice it right down a plane going through that axis, we slice it s several ways. And every time we slice it, like you see these lines here, you get the same uh, image on both sides of that plane. You cut it through, then that's referred to as radial symmetry. And that's not something that us humans or something like the sea turtle you see here, we're bilaterally symmetrical. And there's only one plane that you can cut uh, and that's the sagittal plane, which you see identified right here. And that would cut the animal into right and left halves. So if we were to cut the human animal, let's say a human's uh, facing you, this would be the sagittal plane right here. And you got you, that's the only way you can get mirror images. If you cut it any other way, uh, you would get front and back, and those are not, those are not images, uh, mirror images of each other. Now we ask, what is the significance of radial symmetry? Well, for these animals that either hardly move or move, don't move very well, if you're in an environment, it helps if you can uh, interact with the environment from 360 degrees around you. So uh, that's the advantage of radial symmetry. If an animal comes from any direction that might be a prey item for the sea anemone, it could detect that it's there, uh, sense that it's there, and then react to it. and uh, capture its prey and eat it. So it's a, it's a good way to be able to uh, respond to the environment from 360 degrees around you. Uh, that would be a, a, an advantage to a radial symmetry, uh, to a simple animal like this that does not move. Uh, 
uh, very well. So that's the significance there. So moving on to your basic body plan of uh, Nidarian. Uh, so uh, basically the body wall is going to be the same uh, that we talked about. You can have your ectoderm. The endoderm is the gastrodermis or gastroderm. Uh, and then there's going to be a jelly-like uh, material or matrix that fills between the two. That's called mesoglea. And we can see that uh, in this image here, we'll, we'll point out that uh, in this first picture right here, you can see the two layers, the outer layer in blue. Uh, that's your ectoderm. That's labeled right there. And then your endoderm in yellow which that endoderm is lining what we call the gastrovascular cavity where food would be taken in for digestion. Now between the two colored in a uh, blackish color there is the mesoglea. And uh, uh, so we can see those three layers there. Uh, some other features that you might see here are these uh, sensory or, and feeding structures called uh, tentacles. Okay. And uh, so they have several radiating around the mouth area there. And those tentacles are going to have special cells that are characteristic of this group. They're called nidocytes, uh, which are stinging cells. Uh, so these are characteristic. And these stinging cells have special organelles called nematocysts within the cell. And those nematocysts, when triggered, uh, will eject a harpoon-like structure that would hit the animal animal's body and inject uh, venom in there. And so they have uh, images of these right over here. Uh, so here is, it's a, it's a specialized cell of the ectoderm. And here is an untriggered nidocyte. And then here is when uh, the cell gets triggered. You can see that they, they've drawn this in diagram, the bottom picture of the ejected uh, a filament that would uh, inject the venom in there. Uh, so here is your your nidocyte, the entire cell there uh, within the uh, ectodermis. Uh, there is a little trigger that stimulates the release of this uh, uh, nematocyst, and then this is what that nematocyst or harpoon-like structure looks like when it's uh, ejected uh, to sting the prey. So. Uh, those are our specialized features. Again, the, the middle part where food is, uh, is taken in is the gastrovascular cavity. You'll see it abbreviated as GVC, but make sure you know what that means. You can spell out gastrovascular cavity. Uh, and so, again, the, the major features there, uh, this is uh, actually characteristic of the phylum Cnidaria. So the Cnidarians have nidocytes. Now, uh, these... Uh, this group of animals, simple as they are, are what we refer to as polymorphic or polymorphism. And morph means a structure, shape. It doesn't mean change. If we talk about change, like you see in uh, comic books, things like that, uh, they use the word morph, but that's short for metamorphosis. So a metamorphosis would be where you would change, like from a caterpillar to a, a butterfly. You, you're changing form. But polymorphism means you have more than one structure. And the two main structures are the ones we were looking at earlier. The first structure that I uh, was labeling there to the right was a polyp form. And the polyp is, uh, which means it's going to be attached like sponges. And it'll be attached to some substrate. Uh, and the medusa is the familiar jellyfish shaped uh, structure. So there you can see uh, the image on the right, the drawing on the right, shows you a jellyfish type shape called the medusa. Now the medusa, when they are produced, not all uh, cnidarians go through this. Some cnidarians have lost uh, their polymorphism and will only remain as a polyp, for example, but we'll go over that in a little bit. But the medusa is free swimming. And it'll typically have a larger mesoglea, so that gives, gives them the name, their uh, common name, jellyfish. But they'll still have the same basic structure with the uh, ectoderm, endoderm, the mesoglea, and the gastrovascular cavity, which you can see here. Then you'd have the mouth underneath leading to the gastrovascular cavity, and you'd have your tentacles radiating outward from the mouth with that radial symmetry, and they would have those nidocytes on there. Now, some other important structures uh, that are included 
uh, but are part of the life cycle, include a larval stage after sexual re uh, when sexual reproduction is taking place, uh, called the planula. And so the uh, typical uh, four-year generalized cnidarian life cycle, it's the medusa that would produce a sperm and egg. And this is going to be by meiosis because animal cells, unlike plants, uh, the plant body that produces gametes is already haploid, right? As we talked about that earlier, if you're haploid, uh, the main body of the plant, then it's uh, they go through mitosis and differentiation to produce a sperm and egg cells. But here for animals like jellyfish and humans, our bodies are diploid and uh, they we would have to go through uh, meiosis to make sure that your egg is haploid and your sperm is haploid. Uh, and so when the sperm are produced, they fertilize the egg. The fertilized egg is now diploid. The zygote, uh, which is that first cell after fertilization, same name as uh, any other life cycle, uh, forms an embryo. And the embryonic stage they have here is a stage in animal development called the blastula. Uh, and then af uh, after more dividing and development, then here is your larval stage, which was mentioned earlier, the uh, planula stage. It's a uh, uh, multicellular uh, uh, larva, and the outer cells have these little cilia, so the planula is capable of swimming somewhat. It'll move to another location, uh, land, uh, and settle down, and then develop into your polyp stage there. So uh, another stage comes right before Medusa's uh, produced called the Ephira stage, and that would be an immature Medusa. So we see that labeled up here. If the medusa are produced, that would be called the phyra and uh, the phyra stage. And so here the polyp would produce uh, by uh, some cell divisions and differentiation and development uh, structures that leave the polyp, uh, become ephyra, and then swim off as they develop into medusa. So we see some life cycles of some uh, representative Nidarians will see this life cycle, so it would it would serve you well uh, to learn this general life life cycle. Now we're going to go over some groups where uh, they're they don't produce medusa, so the polyp stage instead of producing medusa would be the uh, one that would produce sperm and egg instead. Uh, so make sure you consider the questions that are uh, posted for you as you work through the lab. Uh, I'm not going to go over them here. But it's something that you can uh, reach out to me and ask about, or I may actually mention during this uh, presentation here. But the thing you always want to uh, consider here uh, throughout these labs on the animal survey are those primary or fundamental processes or functions that all animals do. And you might want to remember so uh, what they are, these uh, primary uh, processes or functions of animals, and they include eating. So they have to feed uh, reproduction. And the third one is to respond, to respond and adapt to the environment. Okay. So when you're covering uh, the basic structure and functioning of these animals, you're going to want to consider that. So they're gonna, uh, the questions are always going to be asking that and then asking other uh, other other questions about what you observed as you work your way through uh, through the lab. So the first class we're going to look at is the hydrozoa. And the hydrozoa, uh, the background gives you the characteristics. And one of the main ones is to understand that the polyp stage here, or polyp, uh, is going to dominate for most. Well, you say this is the here. I give you a, a representative hydrozoan uh, in this classified here. You're going to already say, well, going back to this life cycle we were looking at here earlier, you're going to know that the polyp stage is the one that dominates. Okay. Uh, and in some, like the first representative we're going to look at, uh, some of them. So again, most dom polyp stage, which means they have a medusa stage, which is pretty reduced, but some. Uh, don't have a Medusa stage in their life cycle. Okay, and if that's the case, then the polyp would have to do the process of sexual reproduction. Uh, and this is the case here for this first uh, uh, representative here. This is Hydra, 
and Hydra uh, is the genus. So this, uh, the genus Hydra is a name you're going to have to know. And if you were to write it out during an exam, you would have to write it out because it's a genus. You always underline it. You don't underline class. You don't underline phylum or animals or kingdom animalia or the domain eukaryote, but you do uh, underline genera. Now, I do have a video here that shows uh, that you can click on, and it'll show the hydra feeding. Uh, and basically, I have an image here of what the hydra would look like uh, there. And they have, in the video, they have these little aquatic uh, uh, crustaceans called brine shrimp, and uh, they belong to a genus called Artem Artemia. They're a different phylum of animal. And they show it swimming around, and you can see the hydra waving back and forth, and the, the hydra uh, ends up, uh, well, the, the brine shrimp ends up colliding with the hydra's uh, tentacles and gets stung, and it completely is immediately immobilized, and the hydra takes it in, and you can see the gastrovascular cavity expanding on there. Uh, so you would want to check that out. Uh, before you answer uh, any questions about its movement. But I did find some, some other cool images here. The, this hydra, uh, species that are in this genus hydra, again, they don't have a polyp stage. But one way they might reproduce is through budding, and this is asexual reproduction. So you see in the bottom image there, you can see budding here. You can see an entire another polyp uh, just uh, growing off the side of this hydra, uh, and then it'll eventually break off, and then... Uh, it's basically a clone of the parent hydra, and uh, you can see in the in the diagram, the black and white diagram above here, you can see two uh, uh, little polyps budding off of there. Uh, so what happens then if they don't produce a medusa? Do they still do sexual reproduction? Yes, but the testes that produce the sperm by meiosis and the ovary that produce the eggs by meiosis are produced within uh, within the polyp itself. Uh, so that's uh, something. There now uh, another activity that is supposed to be done I I if we were in the laboratory would be to look at uh, again live hydra, and you would have them in a petri dish because they're small, but you still need a like a dissecting scope to see them quite well. Maybe magnify them uh, anywhere between five and fifteen uh, power of magnification. You're looking at them, and if you were to tap on the petri dish, that would uh, startle these things and they're they're capable of sensing their environment right they respond and then you would see the hydra kind of squish down or contract down uh and as you see that as they move around you start to note that number one that's one of fundamental process they're responding to the environment and then you might see if you gave them some brine shrimp you'd see them feeding that's another fundamental process but you note that they're moving so that brings up something that's pretty important, that now that we're seeing tissues, because in sponges we didn't see tissues, now that we're seeing uh, tissues, these hydra have some very simple muscle type uh, tissue and nervous tissue. The nervous tissue to stimulate the muscle cells to, uh, to contract and to respond to uh, things in the environment. So uh, nervous uh, type tissue, so very, very simple uh, rudimentary uh, types of tissues there. So here are some questions that uh, you might uh, make sure you ask for yourself. Now, it, without live hydra and a video that doesn't show them uh, responding to tapping on their substrate uh, that they're uh, attached to, I did mention what would happen, so you could answer that. They're going to contract downward and respond to that. Make sure you answer these other questions, uh, as many as you can, and reach out to me if you can't answer them. I'll help you answer them or say, oh, you can't answer that because we didn't do any observations at all. Uh, and then uh, the lab also calls for you to look at a cross-section through uh, a hydra, a member in the genus hydra. And so you think, here's the body of the hydra. It's a polyp. And if we were to do a cross-section through the, through the gastrovascular cavity, this is what you would see, and you need to be able to identify the different structures in cross-section. The body's going to look round. The inside is the gastrovascular cavity. Okay. The outside is your uh, ectoderm or epidermis, and the inside is your endoderm, which is also referred to as the gastrodermis, and then the layer in the middle is the mesoglea. Uh, so make sure you can uh, identify these structures if you were given an image similar to this in your, uh, on any quizzes or exams. Uh, you would know that it's a cross-section through the hydra. Then there is uh, another 
uh, slide to look at in the Venus Obelia. And this is still Hydrozoa. We haven't gone into any other classes yet. So again, if you're going to write out the name uh, with a pencil and paper, you underline it. If you're typing it, you italicize it the way it's italicized right here. Uh, now, Obelia is a hydro, uh, hydrozoan, so that means the polyp stage dominates. But these are going to be a colony, and you can see the colony right here, I'm underlining it, of polyps. And this colony has, and this is key to answering one of the questions you're going to see, is the colony has two kinds of polyps. Some are feeding polyps. They have the tentacles with their stinging cells for reaching out and uh, stinging and grabbing prey. And then they have polyps that are producing medusa. Uh, and they're not feeding. And you can see a little Medusa right there escaping, an immature one, which you would call it an Ephyra, uh, and then escaping there. Uh, and there's uh, nothing sexual about this yet, so the, the genetic composition of the, of the cells that make up the Medusas that are leaving are genetically the same as the cells that of the polyp that produced them. But a key to answer one of the questions is to understand that the gastrovascular cavity, which I'm tracing here, is common or interconnected to all of the polyps in the colony. So the feeding polyps, when they take the food in, as they're breaking down the food, they can provide uh, nourishment to any other polyp within that colony there. So even the, the ones that are producing the, the, uh, the medusas. Now, the ones that are feeding, it's going to be easy because the ones that are feeding have a gastro uh, vascular cavity. So those are called the gastrozoids, and this is black mold. So you need to make sure that, uh, that you know that this type of polyp in the colony is called a gastrozoid. And the one that produces the medusa, which will eventually, as they mature, form ovaries and testes, which are called gonads, right? The gonads are where uh, sperm and egg are produced by meiosis. That's how I'm going to remember, gonozoa, gonozoids. These gonozoids are going to produce medusa, which have gonads. So that's why you might remember that one. Now, if you were to look at a slide in the laboratory, you give it. Well, we, you can do this lab without looking at the slides. It's always kind of nice to look with the microscope because it's really cool when you find these. Uh, it's even better if you can see live colonies. That's even cooler. But without a microscope, you could still look at what you might see. And I found this image online. And this one is not labeled, but number one right here, that would be a feeding uh, polyp or a gastrozoid. And then right here is a gonozoid. And you can see the gastrovascular cavity along the colony. Now, the medusae uh, produced are mature, and within their bodies, within the intestines, ovaries, meiosis takes place, producing sperm and egg. We fertilize, we get a zygote, there's the blastula mentioned earlier, and then here is that free swimming planula stage, which you need to know. Okay? Uh, and eventually settles down and grows into a new colony. Now, the lab also calls for you to look at Obelia medusa, and they're pretty small, so you would need the microscope to see them. Remember that the medusa is not the dominant, the polyp is the dominant uh, situation for these hydrozoans. So here's your medusa. We're looking at it maybe from the, the oral side where the mouth is right down here. You can see the tentacles coming off of there. Uh, it's your typical medusa looking uh, morph. So there's some, be some questions for you to answer about Obelia. Make sure you answer them. Uh, and again, I always recommend your sketching and labeling uh, throughout labs. If there's some if there's structure you need to know, if there's a life cycle you need to know, make sure you sketch them. Uh, the main life cycle you need to know is going back to this one right here. Make sure you know the one there at the top and that you can relate it to any life cycle you see for Nidarians. If you can do that, you don't have to memorize the individual but instead be given a life cycle and you can go and interpret it quite easily. Okay. So you want to answer those questions. Now, another interesting uh, uh, member that is found in uh, the class Hydrozoa is, is uh, the genus Physalia. So that would be, it's pronounced Physalia, and it's underlined, it's a genus, and you always capitalize uh, these genera. And what this one is, is a colony of polyps. And uh, some of the colony uh, polyps uh, actually combine to form uh, this structure here that carries air in it and helps this colony of polyps float around the oceans. Uh, this is a marine. And it's called a pneumatophore. 
And pneumatophore means to carry air. Phores means to carry, and pneumos means air. Yeah, you probably heard of that, like with pneumonia. Pneumonia is when you have a problem with uh, exchanging gas uh, with the tissue in the lungs. Uh, and several things can cause pneumonia. Uh, right now, uh, that COVID virus that's uh, uh, caused us to go to an online situation uh, causes, uh, it causes uh, a type of pneumonia that's uh, been uh, not really been described, I think, as I understand or heard it uh, uh, described. Uh, but still, that creates a problem with um, exchange of gas. Here you can see that some of the colony members are gonozoids uh, and gastrozoids. Okay? And the gastrozoids in there are the ones that are helping to digest down the food. And so you can imagine that here you have this massive colony of cells, and they're capturing food, and they're, they have this interconnected, like the interconnected colony of, of polyps, able to pass food on to each other. Uh, and these tentacles here have uh, stinging cells. And every now and then, we live uh, right by the coast here, relatively speaking, compared to others. And uh, we live near the Gulf of Mexico. And if you go out to the to the barrier island at South Barrier Island, you'll see these. Uh, uh, you may see these wash up every now and then. I know I've seen them a few times in, in, uh, that I've been out there. And then there's another one. Uh, that we're encouraged to study in the laboratory called gonionemus. So gonionemus is, and you want to practice writing these and saying them, that way you can recall them because it's another genus you need to know. And the thing about gonionemus is for a hydrozoan, the medusa is relatively large. You can see it with the unaided eye. And this gives us an opportunity to study uh, the structure of medusa in better uh in a bit more detail because it's much larger. You can see a medusa of gonionemus in the petri dish. I found this uh, image there and shared it with you. And you can see the metric ruler beside there. So you can see the diameter uh, is uh, at least three centimeters. And so you can see this with your naked eye. Uh, you can see the tentacles there with the arrow blue. Uh, you can see where the mouth is in the middle. Uh, and then there was this really cool image with a black background showing gonionemus there. And I found a, a video of Gonianema swimming, so you might want to click on there and check that out. It was the footage was actually taken by high school students that got uh, some live uh, individual Gonianemas and were able to video them in their laboratory. I wish I was in that high school lab, so let me tell you, that would have been really cool. But the uh, parts, you do need to know some of the morphology or structure of um, Medusa. And the Medusa, you want to understand where the velum is. The velum is that bell-shaped structure that uh, is a characteristic of a jellyfish. And then you have your tentacles from underneath. So that bell-like uh, structure uh, with, uh, 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 is capable of contracting and helping the animal swim. It's called the velum. Uh, and then underneath that velum, you're going to have where the mouth is. So here's your mouth right there. And there may be some of these uh, uh, extensions coming out from there, but there's that opening in there. So that means that right once you enter the mouth, you're going to get into uh, the digestive cavity or the gastrovascular cavity. And uh, I may not have pointed this out before, but they only have one opening. So if they take any food in and anything that's waste, they have to spit it back out the same opening, right? So uh, they only have one opening. And so any food that gets into the gastrovascular cavity starts to get broken down, but it can be passed to what parts of the velum and other parts of the animal uh, through these radial canals. So these radial, radial canals radiate outward from the main structure of the gastrovascular cavity. And then they connect down here at the bottom with the circular canal. So that allows for any nutrients that have been broken down to be passed on to uh, throughout uh, the body of the animal. So make sure you can identify these, these structures here, you know, the tentacles, uh, the velum. And then along these radial canals, uh, at least in gonionemus, you're going to see these large uh, structures that uh, you can see in the petri dish uh, picture. You can see them there. Those are the gonads. So these would be the structures that would produce sperm or egg by uh, meiosis. So make sure you can identify those in the image. You can label them when you see a picture uh, without any choices. So the velum, the mouth. Uh, the radial canals, the circular canal, and the gonads, and the tentacles. I would I would make sure you, you can recognize tentacles. 
So moving on, now there's some questions to answer about uh, uh, Gonia Nemus, and it's asking, why is the surface of the tentacles very rough? So I'll go ahead and answer this one here. If you're looking at uh, Gonia Nemus under a dissecting scope, which is against, it, it doesn't magnify as much as a microscope. Our dissecting scopes in our laboratories magnify up to about 30 power. And if you look at them up closely, you're going to notice they look rough, and when you look at them real close under magnification, you're going to see these the structures that make them look rough. And those uh, so those structures are going to basically be dense collections of these uh, nidocytes. Uh, so uh, the nidocytes have the stinging uh, uh, organelles called nematocysts, so they have these dense batteries. The battery is just a dense collection of them, and that's for stinging and capturing the prey. Now we move on to uh, the jellyfish. The jellyfish are more dominant, uh, and you're supposed to look at uh, some in a jar of medusa. Now, the medusa are uh, in the Skypozoa as the dominant stage, so that's a big time characteristic for Skypozoa. We just finished with the class Hydrozoa, and the Hydrozoa include Gonionemus. Uh, as big as that medusa is, it's still con uh, the polyps, uh, this, this genus, Gonionemus, is still in class Hydrozoa. For Skyphozoa, the dominant stage is the Medusa, and the Medusa are more well-developed, okay? And so uh, here you're going to want to look at, we're supposed to look at, in, in jars, preserved specimens of Aurelia and another one called Cassiopeia. And while the Medusa is more dominant here, and in fact, uh, one of the largest invertebrate animals is, uh, is a jellyfish, that the diameter of the medusa is over two meters, or about two meters. So that's more than six feet uh, in length. So this is a huge, huge uh, jellyfish. Uh, Aurelia and Cassiopeia aren't that big. In fact, I found this image of uh, uh, Cassiopeia, and you can see the scuba diver in the background. And here, the medusa is swimming upside down, or maybe swimming downward. So you get an idea. Uh, it's a really cool picture there. Uh, that was taken of Cassiopeia. And then the one on the right over here is of Aurelia. And we're looking at it from the bottom. And so here is the bottom edge of the vellum. And unlike our hydrozoans, the hydrozoans had tentacles that came out from the edge of the vellum here. What you start to notice with the Skyphozoa is the tentacles seem to arise right out from the edge of the mouth there. So that's one difference that I've noticed in comparison of the relatively few that I've seen. I'm by no means an expert in uh, cnidarians or invertebrate zoology, but I, this is what I've noticed, right? So we can see these um, uh, these uh, these structures that come right off of the edge around the mouth there. Now. Um, the uh, again, you're going to have nidocytes uh, that are for stinging, but this is your adult medusa here, and you want to going to want to examine them. The other one you're supposed to do is look at the larval stage, which is a planula, which is right here in the life cycle there, uh, and we had slides of those in the lab. And then you're going to look at the polyp stage, which for Skyphozoans has a specific name. Uh, the polyp is called the uh, Skyphistostoma, and so there's your uh, polyp stage now. Remember in Skyphozoans, the polyp uh, stage is not the dominant stage, it's the Medusa stage. And so here's an image of one of those polyps or the Skyphistostoma uh, laying on its side. So you can see the tentacles there, the mouth would be uh, in, in this direction here. And uh, the job for the Skyphistostoma or polyp is to bud off and produce more Medusa. When they do, they produce these uh, immature Medusa called the Ephyra. And Here's an image of what one would look like under the microscope along with its scale. There's the scale of about a millimeter there. Uh, and then the planula down here found an image of them. And that's a, the scale on that bar is about 0.5 mill, millimeters. Uh, and so let's zoom in and look at those real quick. There's your immature medusa, which will eventually become the medusa there on the right. Uh, remember the Medusa have gonads that produce sperm and egg in their life cycle. Fertilization would give you a zygote, your embryo, and then your uh, larval stage. They, in this particular diagram, they didn't draw the zygote, they didn't draw the blastula, which is the embryo, but they're already at the planula stage that goes and settles. So here's the images of what planula look like under the light microscope. 
if you're to look at them in the lab. Uh, and then eventually the planula settles somewhere and develops into uh, the polyp stage. So that's uh, for Aurelia, and that would be Aurelia's life cycle. So make sure you can recognize uh, those important stages, their polyp stage, their medusa stage, the immature medusa, and uh, the larval stage called the planula. Make sure you know those terms too. No planula, uh, the polyp or Skyphistostoma. I'll probably accept polyp for this uh, on an exam, but it, and Skyphistos has got a spe more specific name. You need to know the, the, the word Ephyra for uh, the immature Medusa. So there's your life cycle again without those images, and we've already gone through that. And there's a question to answer about. Um, about the tentacle arrangement uh, for our representative uh, Skyphozoan or jellyfish. Moving on to the class Anthozoa, these include the sea anemones and corals. And the laboratory calls for you to look at a dissected specimen already, already dissected for you, but let's take a look at what a sea anemone is. Now the sea anemones are actually capable of moving, but for the most part when you're observing them, they're going to be attached. Uh, so they look like a polyp. So this is the polyp stage, and they don't have a medusa stage at all. Okay. And But they are a bit more complex in body structure. They have the tentacles surrounding the mouth uh, there, that one opening they have. And inside, they're going to have their gastrovascular cavity there. Now, these guys can actually pick up and move, uh, uh, capable of scooting along the ground there. And so if we were to enter into the mouth, we're going to see that right away we're not exactly in the gastrovascular cavity. you got to go further down. So first entry, we're in a structure called the pharynx. And then once you get down into the gastrovascular cavity, you're going to see that the gastrovascular cavity is more complex. It has full inward foldings, and those inward foldings are called septa. So they've identified a septum there. And just like any foldings, these foldings are going to increase surface area. That's going to be for better digestion and absorption of nutrients into the body of the animal. Okay. Uh, so these are um, uh, sea anemones. And the uh, representative genus is Metridium. And that was the one they were asking for you to look at in the lab and dissect or look at a specimen dissected. And make sure you can identify for a sea anemone that it is a sea anemone. If I ask taxonomy, it belongs to the class Anthozoa. Of course, it's an animal, right? The phylum is Cnidaria. So you might make flashcards with a picture of a sea anemone and put all those names there. Be able to recognize the mouth, the tentacles. And if we were to do a cross-section through the body of the animal, this is what it would look like. You can see the septa uh, within there. And the, they, it looks like they sectioned it through the pharynx right here to give you that image. They didn't section lower in the gastrovascular cavity. That would be lower in there. So it might look different if we went in uh, into the gastrovascular cavity. Now, the uh, background does mention that uh, these animals are capable of asexual reproduction by way of fragmentation. So let's say that the sea anemone wants to pack up and move its location. Uh, so it'll detach its foot and move somewhere else. And if a little piece of that foot stays behind, it's fragmented, and that fragment can actually grow into an entire clone of that sea anemone. Uh, so that would be fragmentation. Now for the corals, uh, the, there's a, a diversity of corals. They have a couple imaged here. And the thing about corals is they're tiny little polyps, and they, they secrete and produce this calcareous skeleton around themselves. And they're living in the colonies, so... You, you get these colonies, and uh, overall you would get this l rather large uh, calcium-based uh, skeletal structure. And everywhere you see a little depression or a, a little dimple within there, there's a little animal in live coral, a little polyp in there feeding. Now remember, this is anthozoa, so these guys don't produce uh, medusa. There's no medusa stage. Another interesting representative uh, of the corals and the anthozoa is tubipora. This is called the pipe organ. Uh, coral. This is because the structure of the, of, the, the, of the exoskeleton of these animals, it looks like pipes that come out of the top of a pipe organ, uh, which is a kind of instrument there, but the polyps would be inside uh, each of those. And what you're looking at is the exoskeleton of the, of the coral. 
Uh, and then finally we end with the Cubozoa, and you can see that their medusa is box-shaped. Uh, so this gives them their name. They have four corners. Here's one corner. Here's another. And from each of the four corners, they're going to have a collection of tentacles that come out. Uh, these guys are described as being pretty good swimmers and voracious predators. Uh, and again, they're stinging cells here. Now, there's a species that uh, lives off the coast of Australia that the venom of... Uh, found in the nematocytes is extremely deadly, a very, very small amount to kill uh, many, many men. Uh, uh, so that's what you call a very potent toxin. It seems that Australia has quite a bit of uh, venomous animals, both on land and in the waters out there. That's pretty interesting. Side note, so know the class Cubozoa uh, and be able to recognize it by image.